Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Museum of the Moving Image Online. My name is Sonia Epstein, and I am our curator of Science on Screen here at the museum. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you from near and far for Dirty in the Kitchen, Yeast and Bread Making. Before we begin, uh, I just want to briefly acknowledge that as everybody knows, this is really not an easy time for anyone and particularly for the museum as an institution. It is a very challenging time financially with our physical doors closed, as you might imagine. So if you're at all able to donate the suggested $10 or really any amount, uh, we'd be greatly appreciative. As nice as it is imagining all of us together in the museum right now, I am particularly excited about this event because this is definitely one that we could have never pulled off in a theater. With so much of the world under quarantine and spending a lot of their time indoors, obviously there's been a huge surge in uh, home cooking and in baking, baking bread in particular, uh, so much so that basically it's become a joke on the internet. Nevertheless, it is an extremely satisfying and grounding activity. And what I found through a little research is that yeast is a very fascinating organism responsible for a lot of very crucial things to our livelihood, uh, particularly right now, such as making vaccines, producing alcohol, and uh, leavening bread. So to take a look at that last action, we are very lucky tonight to be joined by two fabulous guests. Avery Ruzica is the founder and head baker of Manresa Bread and in San Francisco and was recently just named a 2020 James Beard finalist. So we are very excited to have her on. And Nicholas Money is an expert in mycology who has authored numerous books about the microbial world, including The Rise of Yeast, which I can highly recommend. And he is also a professor of botany at Miami University. So please join me in a uh, virtual, I would say, round of applause, or also silent, as we welcome them both on. Okay, here you guys are. Amazing. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hello, everybody. Yeah, Great. We're so, yeah, go ahead. No, just excited to be here tonight. <laughs> so, uh, before we get started, maybe you can uh, each tell us where you're calling from. Nick, where, where are you right now? I'm actually on the campus of Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, in a building that is supposedly haunted, 1871 Peabody Hall. So I'm here on my own in this huge building. So perhaps the ghost will visit when we're done talking. We'll see. Awesome. Um, and I am calling from in from my home in Santa Cruz. Um, so uh, we are, it's my day off and we, been having a really nice time uh, working with bread all morning. So excited to talk about it. Great, very cool. Uh, so to begin, uh, I'm actually gonna start with a very brief home science experiment, at least setting it up, uh, which you can all do in your home with very few active uh, items. So basically here we have a nice mixture. This is one cup of warm water, two tablespoons of sugar, and one packet of dry yeast mixed all together. And then I'm gonna pour it into this one pint bottle. Excuse me for one second. Pouring, pouring, not spilling. It's so brave to do this live. You know, <laughs> fingers crossed. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> I don't wanna find out, but I'm also terrible at not spilling things. So. <laughs> so you do this, we have this nice little mixture, and then I have this beautiful zebra uh, printed balloon from the local party city that I'm going to affix to the top of this bottle. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this is not as elegant as one could hope. And this is what it looks like. And I'm going to just put it on my table here and we're going to come back to it in let's say 10 minutes or something and we will see what's going on. Did you just okay. mix the the yeast? Yeah. You just mixed in the yeast right now, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the yeast and the sugar. Yep. Okay. It's already a little bit foamy, but we'll discuss why, not to spoil the surprise. So, um now back to the show. What we're going to do is we're going to start uh by the three of us looking at a short 1927 
video uh, called Mold and Yeast that has some headings that tell you uh, who it was made by, uh, which was sort of interesting. And Nick and Avery are going to narrate some of it as an introduction to the subject matter. Um, and then we'll go from there. And I think as you can see in the chat, we, uh, we will be taking questions from the audience in a little bit. So if questions come up as you're watching the video um, or you came to this with questions or anything, just feel free to chat them and we will hope to get to them shortly. So now bear with me for one second while I start the video and we will enjoy watching it. Mold with the English spelling. Mm. <laughs> which we don't see again in, in the video. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I hadn't noticed that before. LD elsewhere. It's a... So this is, this is stop motion photography here, sort of Wallace and Gromit style showing mold on fruit. Why does it say mold spots on leather? I mean, that's a, a festering <laughs> footwear and it gets worse on in the next picture. Yeah. Spots on clothes. I mean, that looks like a, a shroud dragged out of a medieval grave or something. It's, it's, it's beyond moldy. The bread mold is a little lighter though, which is, yeah, that's, more, yeah that's a little bit more of a spot. More, more sensible, yeah. Yes. Less extravagant. Okay, so so what is this? This they said is bread mold. Uh, this, this isn't yeast. This is a, a filamentous. Yeah. And the the photography is is actually really good. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the images in this we've uh, watched before. It's it's some um, very clear. So, so I think some people might not know mold uh, is also a fungus. I just want to sort of. Right. Establish that as a baseline for people who are watching this. Why are we we're talking about yeast, but we're watching this film, you know, yes, that has that starts with mold. What do they have in common? Yeah, the first part of the film's looking at these filamentous fungi, including this bread mold. Um, but yeast, Saccharomyces, and other yeast uh, kinds of yeast belong to the same kingdom of organisms. They're all fungi. We've got these filamentous things, and you can see filaments there, filamentous fungus, and then yeast that grows in this budding form that we'll see in the um, second half of the, the video. Well, it's live action there showing the spores being, well, he's, he's pushed them away from the, the spore stalk on which they were formed. The development of mold. Do these yeasts, like that yeast in particular, does it grow at a certain rate? Are there yeast strains or fungi strains that grow much, much faster? I mean, is that? It varies a, varies a great deal. And it depends on temperature and it depends on the, the species. Mm -hmm. um, but these, these molds that we're looking at by and large are not fermentative. They're not, they're not going to, we couldn't use those in bread baking or for, for, for um, raising dough. But there, and this is an animation here showing how the little colony of the filamentous fungus develops. It shows the whole life cycle and it's really quite, it's well put together, it's well edited. And then it shows the fungus producing a next, next generation of spores. So yeast does produce spores, but in a very different fashion. So this thing is producing airborne spores. So an artist must have drawn this on some on a board and then yeah. It's, it's, it's really kind of pretty. I like I like, like watching them. It is, it's very clear, isn't it? What what was the year? Yeah. 1920 something? 27, yeah. Tons of information in here. This is showing um sexual reproduction in, in these filamentous fungi now because it's saying two different strains. So we could refer to them as different mating types, I mean, they are, one could refer to them as different genders. It's a plus or a minus strain here. You can see them identified on the, 
the image here and they're growing together. So these are this mold, these are molds that like we would just see, I think, as they said, you know, on bread or on shoes or anything like that. It's not, uh, yeah, it's mold. It's not fungi like absolutely or whatever. And they're growing else. together, but yeah. what they do is they'll they 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 this is called conjugation. So the two strains come together and their cells actually fuse, and then they're actually going to form spores in that that place where these two strains have mated or come together. And that's what you're looking at there. And, and again, the clarity of this, because this is a highly magnified image, is just pretty high quality. Who would have been the intended audience for this movie, this, this originally? That's a good so question. this was probably an educational uh, film. It was made by the British Medical Association, but also in basically in partnership with MIT and with Kodak. So, you know, okay. early, early days of cinema, there was a lot of, oh. you know, educational film, short, edu short films for educational use. Um, and what is happening now? Well, this, this is, is still the little spores after they've germinated. And it, this is in, in, in sort of real time action here is just showing the movement within these cells, which is, which is true of, of fungi. There's a lot of motion within their cells. They're not at all okay. when you look at them under the microscope. So this, this is the eponymous moment. Uh, the, the yeast packet here, um, you saw the slide earlier, it said yeast grows in a sugar solution. So if you remember my little science experiment, it was water, sugar, and yeast. So just a little preview of what's to come. What do you think he's mixing it with there, Nick? Do you have any idea? Well, he's, he's, just, some kind of, yeah. he's just put the yeast in, in, in water, I guess, here. Mm -hmm. He's now wearing a lab coat, though, so that makes the whole thing far more impressive. Whatever liquid he's using, it's it's got to be good, right? <laughs> it could be the same guy, guy throughout the video. We mentioned that earlier. I don't know. He just changes outfits. <laughs> That's right. Just change the coat. And then we have... So these are individual yeast cells, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and they're jiggling around in, in the fluid under the microscope. It's called Brownian motion, thermal motion that's pushing them around. And then, so this is nice, so it's, it's animated, but it's showing the way that a, a yeast mother cell will produce a daughter cell or bud. So she extrudes that from her surface. We, we, we use the feminine pronoun, there's no good reason for that, but we always refer to the yeast mother cell and, the, and that she produces daughter cells, but there's no, no basis for really assigning. Uh, so do yeast reproduce asexually or like we saw the other yeast, you know, mating or the other mold, I'm sorry. They, they do both, but what you're looking at there and is um, just, it's, it's asexual, it's just producing buds. It's a, it's a process of creating clones of, of the mother cell. But yeast, yeast does reproduce sexually too, and that's a, a different process. Has he got huge hands, or is it just the <laughs> dough on massive hands? So it's why a, is the yeah. temperature important, Avery? Um, well, temperature, as like we were, I guess as I was asking before, temperature is gonna um, kind of increase or decrease the rate at which your your yeast is kind of going kind to of multiply or therefore your bread's going to ferment. So um, kind of being aware of your temperature when you're baking is just one more tool for you to kind of in theory control or at least sort of direct the bread as you um, towards the ultimate goal of whatever it might be. So you might have a timeline in your, in your schedule at work or you might have um, you know, you, there are a lot of different things. So temperature is really important, I guess, in controlling fermentation. Got it. Okay, so that was the exciting 1927 video, Mold and Yeast. Um, and to jump off of that and come back to you, Avery, what we saw yeah. in the film um, at the end was, you know, he was unwrapping the package of yeast and then he was also, you know, shaking a package into that huge uh, mixture. When you bake, you are the head of a bakery. Uh, what what do you what do you use as like a leavening agent, and why, or what's the difference between, say, a packaged yeast and something people might be familiar with, which is a starter? Yeah. Um, well, when when we bake at the bakery, at my bakery, um, for our breads, we primarily make sourdough breads. Um, so that means that we have 
a wild yeast um, that we've kind of cultivated and we maintain on a regular feeding schedule. Uh, this is a much slower process and in, I guess slightly more laborious in that you have to maintain a schedule with it. You, It's not simply walk in the door, mix bread. You Multiple steps have had to happen previous to the moment where you're mixing bread and they'll have to continue happening if you plan to continue to make bread. Um, we, with a commercial yeast, uh, like what we were seeing in the video, um, or a package of yeast, um, that yeast is basically, we the, the yeast that was shown in the video what had some moisture content to it. Um, so we typically refer to that as cake yeast. Uh, it's actually fairly hard to find if you're not a um, professional baker, as in if you can source it from one of your purveyors. Um, in the Midwest, uh, kind of like in Wisconsin, in Michigan, where there's a, still, I think, a little bit more of a baking tradition, you could you can find that at the grocery stores, but I almost never, I don't think I've ever seen it in, in almost all of California, um, and definitely I'm from the East Coast originally, and I never saw it growing up there either. So, um, so what we actually use, because I, I do use commercial yeast in our pastry products, um, we use the dehydrated, uh, so it's, it's typically referred to as instant yeast. Um, and we, there's a couple different varieties of it dependent on what kind of product you're going to make. Um, so what I thought was interesting um, or what this video kind of prompted in my mind was uh, the difference between these three, or excuse me, these two things, commercial yeast and sourdough um, yeast strains. And so I thought an interesting way to look at that would be to, um, make a dough um, using all the same variables in terms of quantities of water, flour, um, salt, um, but then to change the actual uh, yeast source that I use. So um, I've got in with me, I have some of my, um, my natural starter. So I don't know if you guys can see that. It's bubbly. It's, it's, we call this a liquid starter. It's, um, that means that it's, We've got equal parts flour and water. And then we do everything um, in baker's percentages, which means that we compare everything to the quantity of flour. So in baker's math, you have 100% flour and everything else is a ratio to flour. So this is 100% flour, 100% water, and 20% of my previous, my older starter. So, um, so it once it's when you initially mix it, it has sort of a almost a, a paste-like texture, and then this has been fermented overnight, um, and so it's it's liquidy, but it's not pure. It's not like you could. It's not exactly pourable. I mean, it's got some body to it, and that's what we're looking yeah, for when we make. Yeah, we want that to look like that um, when we make bread because this means that there's still activity going on that the yeast hasn't consumed all of its food source. Um, You've got bacteria in there too, Avery, right? I mean, there's yes. like is in there. Yes, yeah. yes. And it, you know, exactly what that makeup, I, I'm not, you know, I, I have not had the, uh, I have not had any testing done, which is something that you can have done, which I think is interesting, um, you know, uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of, a lot going on in this. Um, but now if we look at this, this is a pouliche. So, um, I don't have any little yeast granules in front of me um, to show you guys, but they just look like um, uh, there's, I have a photo that we can show in a minute, but um, this is my pouliche. So we have a commercial yeast and we have a sourdough starter. But if you take a pinch of commercial yeast and combine it with equal parts flour and water, so similar to what we did with our sourdough starter, only we put a very small percentage of yeast. This is um, a 0.25% yeast to, uh, to 100% flour and water. So um, very, very small amount of yeast. And then you let that ferment, uh, typically at least, um, you could use it after six, six hours, but you could use it for multiple days. So this is actually a day and a half old. I've had it in the refrigerator. Um, but my point here is that what we look at, it looks um, similar to a certain degree to my starter. It's got kind of some body to it. Um, and so what we're, what I what thought was interesting was to take, to sort of mimic, um, using commercial yeast, you can actually sort of, to some degree, mimic sourdough starter um, in terms of, and, and just visually right now, you can see that this sort of looks like my sourdough starter, which when you put flour and, um, excuse me, when you put yeast with the flour and water 
just commercial yeast as we are in the experiment that um, is being run by Sonia, you have, you'll see that that has a completely different look to it. So I, I, I then decided to make a, a dough. Um, and so I made a dough with each of these things. So I have a dough with commercial yeast and this is a pizza, I made a pizza dough. Um, so this is a pizza dough. It's um, very fluffy. It's very airy. Uh, it is, um, it is, it has a very strong yeast smell to it. There's a specific smell to commercial yeast in my, it's, it's a very specific smell and it's a nice smell, but um, it, it, you can smell this. Like this is strong enough. The yeast smell is strong enough that I can just smell it just holding it here. Then I have my pouliche dough, which is also quite um, kind of puffy. These have been sitting out of my refrigerator for about an hour and a half. Um, uh, and it also, it's not quite as airy as your um, commercial yeast dough, but it has, um, it still has a lot of activity. It's still kind of very active. And then I have my sourdough and you can see that this little guy, he's kind of, a, it seems a lot smaller. Now, all three of these pieces of dough weigh exactly the same thing. They were all mixed at exactly the same time and they were all um, pulled out of the refrigerator this afternoon at the same time. But this guy, he's, I don't know if it, if it captures it very well for you, but he's definitely not as puffy, not as um, airy as the, either of the other two doughs that were made with natural uh, yeast, or excuse me, with commercial yeast. And so, um, you know, Sonia, I don't know if you want to play any of the pictures. Um, yeah, I'll share okay. them right now and so uh, you can talk so over them. Yeah. It, it's not to say that one of these is better or not better than, or worse than the other, but it's just so interesting to me how different they are. Um, so what we have here is our, that's the sourdough starter in water. Um, right before I started the mixing process. So um, for this experiment I did, or for this recipe, I did 70% uh, water in all of the doughs. Um, so you have 700 grams of water in that bucket. Um, and then I did the quantity of ratio of the starters is slightly different because the textures of each starter is different. So that's your commercial start. I mean, excuse me, that's my wild starter. That's my sourdough starter. And then if you wanna go to the next picture, that's the pouliche in water. So that's before I sort of mixed it in. Um, but the pouliche, remember, had that sort of similar texture to um, our natural sourdough starter. But pouliche is typically used um, because it has a lot of moisture in it. It's used as a source of some of the starters, some of the dough's moisture. So you can see there's a lot more pouliche in that bucket of 700 grams of water than there was starter in the previous bucket. And then the last one, yeah, exactly. So much smaller ratio of my sourdough starter. And then this is the commercial yeast. So I just added the commercial yeast um, in, at 3%. Um, uh, no, excuse me, I did not. It was a much smaller percentage because I wanted to make this pizza dough a couple days ahead. So I made all of these doughs yesterday. Um, so I actually did less than 1% uh, commercial yeast. So it's not very much yeast. Um, and that still led to a very you know active dough. And then those are the three doughs. So, so same thing, mixed at the same time and you mix at the same time, same temperature water, same ratios of flour and all other ingredients. Um, but you can see that uh, you have your yeast. Um, the top bucket is my dough made from commercial yeast and it's kind of somewhere between the four quart and the five quart um, line. My sourdough starter dough is way below that. Um, and then my pouliche dough is even potentially slightly larger than my commercial yeast dough. So, mm -hmm. and this was after um, being out at room temperature after mixing, uh, it's been out at room temperature for uh, two hours. Um, and then I um, divided them after this and um, and divided them and shaped them into balls. I, I did not divide the yeast, the commercial, or excuse me, I did not divide the sourdough starter bread because it needed, it needs a lot more time to get active. Um, so, and, and that's, you know, the interesting thing to me about this moment where everyone's home baking and I think it's wonderful. And as the bakery, we're providing sourdough starter to any of all of our customers who would like it. And it's really fun to see everybody taking this sourdough starter home and, and making things with it. But I also think that baking with commercial yeast um, and especially baking with a pouliche uh, is sort of a fun, it's a, it's a fun exercise too. Now, do I love things that are 
I don't always really love a dough that's made with just straight commercial yeast because uh, I think it, it, it moves very quickly. So we talked about temperature and um, no, regardless of temperature, your, your commercial yeast of dough, unless you make a, it with a very small, a very, very small amount of yeast uh, is going to move very fast. And when that, when the- Just as an example of that, this, yeah. <laughs> we'll come back to this once we're full screen, but this is all foam. So this was a commercial yeast packet that was like yeah. 10 minutes. And it's, as you can see, it's blowing up the balloon and we'll talk about why but that's just an um, yeah, So for, for me, just go ahead, Nick. Uh, yeah, Avery, the, the Polish, is that is that like a, a French Levain that would be, be, be used with a French bread? Because they, they'll work with a, it's a starter, but it's not like a sourdough starter because all it is is water and, and, and a commercial yeast, isn't it? Yeah, so that, yeah, I think that's that I would th well. think of pool, Polish as, um, it is really frequently used in baguette recipes um, right. and it gives, uh, so a French baguette is typically made with a, like a poulie style baguette. Um, it, uh, a poulie is, it's this beautiful sort of like hybrid, it's not, it's not a hybrid at all, I mean, on a uh, scientific level, but in terms of a baking like process, I feel like a poulie is this happy in between for both the commercial baker and for the home baker of being able to take a packet of yeast, create something with very simple ingredients, and then dip into it and use it for multiple days to make a product. So in a, in a commercial bakery, um, it's easy to maintain because you're not really taking care of like a, a living thing in the same way that you are with your sourdough starter, where you have to maintain it, you have to build it up. With the police, you can just drop a little bit of yeast into this the flour and water and then have it for multiple days in your refrigerator. And as a baker, scoop out more each day for your baking. And then when you're ready to stop using it, you just toss it away. Um, so I think that it is a, I, I haven't really seen a lot of people baking with police right now. And, and it's something I'd like to, I'd like to experiment more with just as a home baker myself. Um, and then also kind of help help people or recommend people to to experiment with it as well because it um gives you a lot of the it gives you a very specific texture um that is different than sourdough and different than just using a straight yeast dough um we and then I think we want to yeah briefly. exactly yeah that's perfect okay. and then Great. pass it over to Nick yeah okay so this is the pizza dough made with the pulish um so I baked these in my home oven um and I just have like a GE oven, gas oven. Um, I took a sheet pan and flipped it over upside down to make, cause I don't own a pizza stone. Um, and so I put a half sheet pan upside down and I preheated the oven to 500 degrees. And then I pulled all three doughs out. So this police dough, you can see again, all three doughs, the dough balls weigh 250 grams, um, which is kind of your traditional size for like say a, a Neapolitan style 12, 11, 12 inch pizza. Um, so this is the Pulish dough and everything I love about Pulish is like really well represented here. You have a thin crust, you have a lot of extensibility, which means that I can stretch the dough very easily. you got a great rise on the crust. It's super airy. Um, and the texture, I, to a certain degree, I think it captures it in the picture, but you can see that, um, you have this crispy, almost cracker like texture. And that's the same thing that you get with a baguette with a Pulish dough. And that's what I love about Pulish is the texture of it's just a really specific cracker-like crust that gives way to like this beautiful creamy interior. Um, so Pulish dough was number one, first one I baked out of the oven. This is the commercial yeast dough. So it also got a fair amount of rise, but it didn't seem as like, um, it, it wasn't, it was a little denser, um, you know, and, and again, I made all these recipes with the same amount of water. So were I to keep working on developing any of these recipes, then you would kind of say, okay, what did I like or not like about this bread or this dough? Maybe, and then you would start to adjust. But for our purposes for this discussion, I wanted to keep everything else consistent except for the starter. So um, we still have a thin crispy crust. Um, it still has some nice airy air pockets to it, but it's a little bit chewier and it um, it, it wasn't as delicate of a, of a texture. And then the last one, that's the sourdough. So I actually had to wait quite some time before I could bake the sourdough um, pizza because I pulled all the doughs out at the same time and the police dough was ready to go right away. The commercial yeast was pretty much happy, like looked airy and ready to go. But the, the sourdough starter, 
again, it, it just needs more time to get more active. So it, I baked that probably an hour and a half um, later than I baked the coulish dough. Um, it had a very, it had a, a thicker crust to it, like just in terms of um, texture to it. Um, the exterior and then the interior, I don't know, I, I didn't, don't think I have a good shot of that, but the, the interior actually looked more similar. It had a better flavor than the, the yeast dough to, in my opinion, but it actually had a pretty similar texture to the yeast dough. And, and I think that might just be that both the, um, even though the liquid Levon is in this is the sourdough starter and has a fair amount of moisture to it, uh, it still didn't lend as much moisture to the dough as my poolish do my poolish did. So, um, yeah, so it was, but they're really really fun and really different. Um, and I'm gonna share the the recipes. Um, so you'll share the recipes later as well. Yes. Um... That's fantastic. It's making me very hungry. Before <laughs> this it's explodes, gonna explode, yeah. um, <laughs> I want to just take a minute. So as you all remember, this was an, not an inflated balloon. This was just very floppy, very quickly. I would say this bottle is quite warm, which I would like to understand why that is. And this is filling with air. So Nick, first question, why is this balloon inflating? That's a, it's a scientific mystery. Nobody knows. <laughs> Never been solved. We're, we're, we're clueless. What did I bring you on for? <laughs> it's, it's alchemy. It's alchemic, alchemical. I mean, it, it's it's doing what we do when when we when we have access to sugars that we we burn them. We 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 metabolize these these sugars and we release carbon dioxide during that process. So what you're looking at there is the accumulation of carbon dioxide within the within the balloon. And at least early on in this process, there's plenty of oxygen. And so it's going for this sort of Ferrari style burn where it's just that the yeast is going crazy and uh, uh, working through the sugars very, very fast, breaking them down to release energy and multiplying the whole time. So you're getting this, this uh, billions and billions of yeast cells, presumably within that, within that bottle, within a short period of time. What do you start? Did you start off with a whole sort of sachet of free, freeze dry? Yeah. So, I mean, you've got billions of yeast cells in there, and then that's multiplying extremely fast. I mean, they're forming buds all the time, and that's it, carbon dioxide. Essentially, mm -hmm. a, 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 a carbon neutral process because the carbon <laughs> is locked up in the sugars beforehand, and so now it's being released uh, as a gas then. And, and, uh, and, of course, this is when we were looking at the, at the um, pizza crust and so forth. You saw the little pockets of... of, of uh, within the uh, within the crust and i mean that was formed by this process of the yeast cells releasing gas that gets trapped within the within the dough um during that process look at it, it will explode very fascinating you actually let it go yes. and then it will make a mess well, yeah. check back in <laughs> you know 10 minutes um okay so i'm gonna so nick you we saw 1927 video that had some interesting techniques of uh, visualizing the microbial world, uh, shall we say. I have some videos that I'm going to share that you took in the process of your research um, that are not of yeast, but they are of fungi. And I'm hoping that you can just tell us a little bit what is going on in these videos, because I think that they're very cool looking. Um, maybe very briefly, like how you took them and how yeast maybe differs from what we're seeing. I mean, what, what, uh, I'll start sharing them now. Okay. Yeah. So the, these are these are high speed video recordings taken at uh, using a camera that's running at, at hundreds of thousands of frames a second. In this case, you can see what does it say? 210,000 frames a second. And it's actually showing this a particular fungus. This one's called pylobolus that shoots its spores through the through the air. The whole stalk is about ooh, two, three millimeters in height and it becomes pressurized and it shoots this black capsule that's filled with spores into the air. And it works as a squirt gun. And so I've done a lot of work over the years with, with students looking at these movements in fungi. And these, these, are, these are beautiful, dramatic um, events to, to, to watch using high-speed video. Really, really, really beautiful. I mean, yeast doesn't do anything like this as interesting. Yeast is, is not a photogenic 
thing. It's difficult to get enthusiastic about the structure and the, and the, I don't know, the, 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 the movement of yeast cells under the microscope because they don't move very much. It's, it's the, it's the product. It's the uses to which we, we have put yeast that, that make it so fascinating. But in terms of its sort of own artistic qualities, I think they're quite, quite limited. Oh, this is a, this is another, another fungus. It's a, it's a puff ball and it actually uses the energy in raindrops. So the, the, the raindrops falling under gravity. And when they hit the, um, the puff ball, it kind of acts like a, like a bellows and pushes the spores in, into the air. And so that's how it reproduces. Like it waits for a raindrop. Then you got this gorgeous thing. It's a bird's nest fungus. And it also uses the energy in falling raindrops to splash its little eggs out of the nest. So, um, I mean, these are the fungi that have enthralled me during my, you know, the latter part of my research career, but um, it, it occurred to me some years ago that, that the most important fungus of all to Homo sapiens is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the yeast mm -hmm. used for baking and brewing, primarily used for baking and brewing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yet they didn't really know much about it. So that sent me on this journey to really learn a lot more about yeast. So it's fascinating really for, for what it does. It's got a, an interesting evolutionary history. It contributes about a trillion dollars to the U.S. economy every year. Uh, it's, yeast it's, does. It, it, there is no more important microorganism for human civilization, and it's been that way for, well, probably for for most of human history because we've been using we've been using yeast for baking. I mean, I'm, I'm suppose nobody knows for sure, but I think it was an, an invention in in Egypt ancient Egypt, the first time that yeast was used probably accidentally to in, in, by, by bakers, probably because it was transferred from, the, we know that they were brewing, brewing beer using yeast much earlier than that. And it was probably just, just a, a happy uh, happenstance that the, the, the yeast got transferred you know, from the broth on the top of a beer vat into, into, into a bakery and then Indeed, the baker left the dough for long enough to actually see it rise. And this is how the first leavened bread was produced. So it's really interesting history to it, too, in terms of the history of baking and the way that we've used yeast. Of course, we didn't know that it was yeast until the 19th century. That's another thing. We'd been, we'd been using yeast deliberately in baking for a long time without any clue to the, about the fact <laughs> living microorganism. So, okay, I have some follow-ups to that. I, I do just want to remind people that we're going to go to questions soon. So if you do have questions for Nick or Avery about the biology of yeast, about home baking, pizza dough, uh, you know, science experiments, uh, you can feel free to chat them and we will get to them. But yeah, I am, I'm curious, Nick, uh, I guess one thing is, well, one question, should I take this off or should I keep going? <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna let it keep going then. Um, second question is, you know, we saw in Avery's pictures, the, you know, the, the different ways that uh, the commercial yeast, the sort of the starter and then the kind of in-between uh, functioned. I'm wondering if, you know, first, which, which of those options is most interesting to you? At a microbial level, and second, if you can explain a little bit, like what is happening, um, probably in the in each of those, yeah, starter that, that which was the more flattened one, the one that had risen less, I think, in your, your experiment, Avery. I mean, that's that's most interesting from a microbiological point of view, because there you've really got a community of microorganisms. In a in a in a poolish, as I understand it. This is just pure commercial yeast of one strain, genetically identical, and then flour and water that are mixed mixed together. Um, but it's in in the sourdough starter. There's a lot more variation because you're not actually deliberately putting in particular microorganisms at the beginning of this. And, and as Avery said, um, one could do this. You can you can actually figure out precisely what microorganisms are present in each sourdough starter using using uh, molecular genetic techniques, but um, you have a mixture of microorganisms 
And um, it's not only fungi, it's not only yeasts that are present there, it's also um, lactobacilli, so lactic acid um, bacteria that are present too. And it's this, it's, it's a consortium, it's a, it's, a, it's a collaboration between fungi and bacteria that actually provide this, this sour flavor to the, uh, to the resulting bread. So that's, that's, so one is just a, a clonal product. One is a lot more interesting in terms of its ecology and different bakers will, will, will claim that their sourdough starters are, are um, the best. And I'm sure that Ava is a beyond brilliant, but. Um, but they actually have a different flavor. Like to produce it in the first place, Avery. I mean, the sour, the, the start of the. How, the how did I? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, we've started them from from scratch. We also, um, I mean, we had when I first came to work at Manresa, there was a starter that was being used. Um, that was, uh, I would say, not exactly. It wasn't in its best shape. It could, it could be. It was a, a little bit. Um, the feeding schedule was a, a little odd. Um, it was a little bit too, it, was, it wasn't very active. It wasn't very happy or healthy. And if you have a yeast, uh, if you have a sourdough starter that's not very happy, it can look like a lot of different things, but mostly what it looks like is sort of sluggish. So you should see a real difference between the time you feed your starter and like four hours, six hours, eight hours later. You're if you're not... Your language, your language is so interesting, the way that you're describing this and feeding them. It's as if you're a zookeeper, right? Yeah, I mean, that one, that's what attracted me to bread baking in the first place was, um, it, it, was it was bread in general, because, it, because yes, when we use commercial yeast, it's dehydrated, et cetera. But once you start to make this bread, it's like this living thing. And I found that, I found that just incredibly engaging and incredibly, um, satisfying and enthralling and sort of soothing like it's again because um you can observe this like thing changing over time and uh it was just yeah so we definitely treat it i always recommend i think a lot of people talk about sourdough starch this way but i i do the same um thinking about it like a pet like a um uh, really it's like any living thing uh you can observe if you if you have a pretty good green thumb you can see when your plant is thirsty you can see when it's doing well when it needs has too much sunlight it's, it's about observation and i think that sourdough well, baking in general to me is about observation and that's the hard thing though because not everybody can observe the same thing and not everybody's looking for the same things or, it, or the person showing them isn't identifying them the same way so um yeah, so sourdough starters, especially there, because like you said, it's this like sim symbiosis between all of these different things that are going on in my sourdough starter. You have to be, we have to be very consistent. We are very consistent with how we feed it and maintain it. Um, and we've had, I mean, there was, we had one incident at the bakery years ago. We were probably two years into the bakery. The bakery has been, it's a brick and mortar business for five years and seven basically seven years total that I, I've been maintaining the starter a little bit more than that really and one Easter our, was like our sourdough starter we had this it, it's like we killed it basically and I think what had happened was we fed it and we the person who fed it fed it in a container that wasn't completely dried out and maybe had a little bit of um like um soap solution or something in it from being washed and so we went to make the bread and somebody didn't identify that the bread that the starter didn't seem very happy or healthy and they made the bread anyway and then it was like this sort of like what's going on with the bread why is this and it made me realize that for me as a as a baker and as also as like a boss manager we were not i hadn't i understood what i was looking for i and this is part of kind of the reality of like growing a team because if you're the only one having a relationship with that sourdough starter you know what it looks like you know when it needs to be fed you know what you're doing you know you know what it smells like looks like all of those things but now how do you teach that to somebody else and so that moment at the bakery really shifted how we maintained our starter we now feed it in a clear container we mark on the container where it was when we fed it initially and now that way the next person who comes to use the starter can see oh the starter was fed and it was this big at 6 a.m. And now I'm using it at noon. Has it doubled in size? It should have grown over six hours, et cetera. So because if you if you have this sourdough starter and you don't know what it looked like to begin with, and then you're using it X number of hours later, you don't know what's changed. You don't you don't have a, um, a comparison point. So yeah, yeah it, it, it could be complicated. I mean, it, it could be simple, it could be complicated, but I think um, 
that's been sort of the interesting fun thing about, about yeah. a bakery is how do you teach those things? I, I don't I don't think the um, the star of the the Kodak video that we were watching really had that sort of degree of passion. You saw him. At the, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, more industrial. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, baking, it's its a lot, it, you said it was, al you know, you said it was alchemy at the beginning, like, why is this blowing, or why is this blowing up the balloon, and I mean, that's how I still feel like that, like, it's just so cool, like, this, you mix these simple ingredients, and it's like my pizza dough experiment, like, the same 700 grams of water, a thousand grams of flour, three, three, or uh, 30 grams of salt, and then the starter, and like just and now a day later, look, I have three completely different doughs just because one thing was different and everything yeah. else was exactly the same. And that's, I mean, that's really cool, I, I think. <laughs> so. Okay, we have lots of questions. So I'm gonna just ask Great. you guys them. Um, so one of them that's interesting that I think might be on people's minds is if you, I, I think for Avery, if you keep feeding a poolish day after day, will it eventually turn into a sourdough? Um, I would say no, no, because I think that, to, well, so to feed a poolish, the, the, to feed a poolish, the purpose of a poolish, I think, is about the texture that you're ending up with. You might end up with something similar to a sourdough. I, I, I don't know how much you would be able to kind of control what, what, what it becomes. Um, there's, there's wild geese in the air. There's sports around us all the time. Um, but if you're, Feed, by feeding, are we saying that we're adding just fresh water and flour to this poolish again and again? Um, at some point, those yeast, the, the yeast that's in commercial yeast doesn't necessarily keep multiplying itself in the same way. It sort of runs its course um, and it's meant to kind of go fast. Um, you could take a piece of the dough. So that's another style of bread making, which is called pat fermenté, where you take some of your old dough because that's what that means and then you take your old dough and you add it to your your so you almost use your old dough like a starter um but mm. uh you i wouldn't if you're trying to start a sourdough starter i don't think that um trying to take a poolish and translate it or trans sort of metamorphosize it into a starter is going to get you there because i think that the yeast strands that are in the commercial yeast will sort of like keep taking over. It doesn't give a lot of exactly. room. Yeah. 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 The Saccharomyces that's in there, the commercial yeast, it won't work well, even if it beca became, I use the word contaminated with, with the bacteria, the lactic acid. Yeah. They just wouldn't work together. They, you wouldn't get a, a really functioning sourdough starter from that kind of interaction, I think. Yeah. And yeah. then the commercial yeast would keep overwhelming anything else that showed up. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who might not know, from what I believe I know from what I've read is that commercial yeast is really always one particular strain of yeast, which is Saccharomyces. Well, it's one, it's one we, we would regard it as a single species. Okay. Different, uh, different producers would, would, would say that they have often the right. proprietary strain. Okay. Well, right, right. There are some genetic differences there, There's, but yeah. Okay. Um, another question that seems relevant to home baking is from somebody who's asking when ambient temperatures can't be controlled, such as mm -hmm. in her apartment, uh, does giving the yeast more or less time to work always, mm, to work, does that always get the, the desired result? Um, yeah, yeah. So when we think about baking, we're thinking about a couple different variables always. We're thinking about time, temperature, um, Time and temperature are the big thing. And then um, one of the other things we kind of talk about for home baking, I don't think it's very, I, I wouldn't really worry about too much about this, but there's something called the friction factor, which is how much your mixing bowl warms up the dough. So if we're thinking about, we want to make this bread and I want to make, I want to make a loaf of bread that I want to make in my apartment and I can't control the temperature of my apartment, but well, what can I control? I can control time. I can give it, I can decide, if I want a loaf of bread in two days, I can say, okay, maybe it's going to take me two days to make this loaf of bread because it's so cold in my apartment. I can control how warm the dough is when I make it. Um, and so there are definitely ways to push things in the direction you want them to go 
even if you can't make your apartment be 80 degrees, you know, like a proofer would be. Um, and and a, a lot of a lot of breads. What I recommend, especially if you want to bake with sourdough, is to um, make a little space in your fridge and make a bread that is going to ferment over time in your in your refrigerator because your refrigerator is the same temperature all the time. So if you can make a bread that's nice and active and warm, which we can by just temp controlling, um, like to make sure you're, you're, if your apartment's super cold and it's like the middle of winter, then maybe take all of your ingredients and turn your oven on and just have your flour, like have your flour be a little bit warmer rather than like, as if it's really cold, have your water from your tap be nice and warm in this, it could be up into the nineties, it's okay. Um, have your starter be really nice and active and then make a loaf of bread um, that you, get going and kind of keep it at a pretty warm temperature and then retard it in your in your refrigerator for a day before baking it because because your fridge will be the same temperature and if you put something that's nice and active into your fridge whether it's yeasted or sourdough starter a lot of the work of fermentation will happen in the refrigerator and then you'll bake something um it's it is harder if you're trying to do it all in one day i think it's easier if you can't control your ambient temperature to plan on doing something that's kind of a it's not that much more work it's just a little bit more space in your fridge for a couple of days yeah my freezer only has flour in it yeah that's not my <laughs> okay. choosing but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um okay we have a question for nick from alaska which is exciting nick do you know of any other fungi that are important to a similar scale for human civilization i think as yeast so you said, you know, yeast is one of the most, or maybe the most important. Maybe the most in terms of human development. I mean, there would be um, something, the, the, the button mushroom, you know, the white, white button <laughs> mushroom that uh, you buy in the grocery stores and so forth. I mean, I just suppose that's been a, a significant player in, in uh, as a food source for, for what, for d deliberately for, two or 300 years, but no, that's pushing it. I mean, there are people that would claim that, I, I don't want to get into the area of magic mushrooms, but there are people that would claim, for example, that some of the, um, the, the worship of hallucinogenic mushrooms has played an important role in the, uh, the history of humanity. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, um, I suppose it has done in some parts of the parts of the world, but I don't, I don't think there's anything else. I'm probably missing something, aren't I? I mean, truffles and truffle hunting and so forth truffles have played a hugely important role in in in, in especially in european cuisine but no there's nothing else like yeast i mean we we use i mean this di different subject but but yeast in terms of it's it's the production of ethanol of alcohol is of course tremendously important uh, um, has been historically and now as a source of biofuels and as you mentioned in the introduction you know yeast used to produce very many important drugs now. Um, genetically modified yeast is used to produce half of the world's synthetic insulin for insulin dependent diabetics. So I, I can't think of another fungus that's, that's similarly significant. There's lots of fungi that grow on the human body, but that would be a different, uh, you know, part of the human microbiome. Save Those, that too. Uh, they're very important in terms of human <laughs> biology, but maybe not in terms of human civilization. Hmm. Yeah, we, we did get a question. I don't want to stray too far into uh, alcohol for the purposes of this talk. If there's a big request, you know, let me know. But one person did ask that, uh, one person said that they've recently tried brewing beer for the first time and was wondering what the difference is between beer yeast and yeast that you use for baking. So I mean, you, you can actually yeah. use the same. The, the, there's the, the there are particular strains of yeast that you can purchase for brew, brewing brewing beer um, that that have different different qualities. It would take a while to get into that, but you can use use um, commercial um, yeast that you'd buy for baking. That will produce and does produce ethanol. It, it will ferment in that fashion. I mean, this happens in baking, of course, that as as the level of oxygen begins to um, decline within the dough um, as it becomes more and more what gelatinous um, that, that actually the yeast cells begin to produce ethanol but any 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 ethanol that they produce um, is actually driven off during the actual baking baking process which is why mm -hmm. 
yeah it's not a there's nothing so if i drank this not that i'm going to (laughs) it wouldn't be much eventually there'd be a bit but it it would be uh fairly repulsive i think you should uh, (laughs) throw it out of the window is there a dumpster out there just hurl it just checking (laughs) um Okay, we only have a few more minutes. So if you have a pressing question, please write it now. But um, back to baking, one for Avery. Uh, we have someone wondering what the predominant factors are that affect the size of the crumb. Um, a lot a lot of things can affect that. Um, so I think first and foremost, um, do you have to start, if, if we're talking about, if we're talking about a sourdough starter, well, you need to have a happy, a happy strong, like fermentation aspect. So if you're using commercial yeast, you know, you need to have yeast in there. And then if you're using a starter, you need to make sure your starter's happy and alive because that that yeast needs to keep multiplying, keep start consuming the sugars, et cetera. So we start with our, like with our, our fermentation element. Then we need to have um, plenty of, or a, a fair amount of moisture. So um, this has to do with your flour choice. Um, so you're going to develop gluten uh, during the mixing process. Uh, gluten is present in wheat flour always, but it's activated by the addition of water. Um, various flours absorb more water or less water dependent on the variety of the flour, the way that it was milled, um, the etc. And so in order for us to sort of capture, like Nick was saying, the fermentation, the bubbles are a byproduct of this fermentation that's happening. So the yeast is consuming the flour, the sugar in the flour. Um, something has to trap that bubble when we bake it. So if you, you could have a happy starter, but if you don't develop enough gluten structure in your dough, and I'm talking about wheat breads right now, I'm not talking about baking with other, um, other forms of flour. Um, if you don't develop enough gluten, then your even if you had a happy starter, if you don't have enough structure, um, the gluten strands are what you're actually looking at when you when we looked at like that cross section of the pizza dough that is trapped the bubble or the bubble sort of it's a, a, a ton of you know it's millions of little bubbles that are all connected um, and that's kind of capturing it. So so I think that if someone is struggling with making a dough that is has a like a beautiful crumb structure. Um, you first want to make sure that your yeast source is, you know, is good, is, is healthy and viable. Then you want to think about how you're mixing. Now, even as a home baker, you do not need to use a mixer in order to get a strong gluten structure. Um, I recommend doing something called auto leasing, which is where you mix your flour and your water ahead of time um, for like at least 15 minutes because the flour, once it has water connected to it or touching it mixed with it, it will automatically start to develop gluten without you even having to knead it. Like I don't need bread at home. I just mix flour and water, salt and yeast. I mix, I leave the salt out at first for 15 minutes. I let those three things kind of hang out together. And right away, you'll see them go from just like kind of a mixture of like, that just looks like sort of like a paste to 15 to 20 minutes from then, uh, having already some strands to it. And then after that, um, enough hydration is important because if you're working with a flour that absorbs a lot of water, um, like your dough is going to be really tight, which is sometimes something people want. But if you're trying to get a, uh, nice large, like bubble or, um, uh, kind of structure to your dough and you know, you have a ha- happy starter and you know, you've developed plenty of gluten. Then the next thing to think about is do I need to add a little bit more water to this because that's going to make a dough that's a little bit, um, if it's well developed, it's going to be nice and extensible. And then that's going to give you like this volume to your dough. That's kind of a lot, but yeah. <laughs> no, that was, I'm very impressed by the way. I mean, baking is such a tactile, like visual, like you said, yeah. process. I think to be able to put it into words is, must be very challenging. So we will be sharing Avery's recipes, by the way. Yes. So if you want any of this written down. Um, yeah, and people we, can also yeah. email. No, just that I am happy to always answer bread baking questions. So if people email me at info, it's info at manresabread.com. I'm happy to, it might take me a couple of days to get back to people, but I'm happy to help people with their baking questions. So just careful what you offer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's I know. very but nice of you. Fun. I'd rather talk about <laughs> no, bread than great. a lot of things these days. So that's fine. <laughs> Fair point. I agree. Um, we have to wrap up very sadly, but you know, we have one more question that maybe 
can translate into a final question. Um, it was a follow-up on Avery, something that you said that uh, commercial yeast grows faster. And the question is, do you think that slower processes make better breads? Um, so maybe mm -hmm. uh, Nick and Avery, as a final question, Avery, I'd like you to answer, but also if you wanna say like what your favorite kind of bread yeah. is or your favorite recipe and Nick for you too. Yeah, I so um, I, I don't think it makes better bread. I think that I I feel like there's the point of making bread is community, something delicious. It's really fun, you know. There, the, what what's better for you or not uh, is is very much an individual thing. Now, is from a flavor perspective, from a um, yeah, from a flavor perspective, you cannot say that a sourdough bread and a commercially leavened bread taste exactly the same. They don't, they taste different. Some people like the way that a, a you know, people have their preferences. Um, is it a faster product potentially? Yes. And does that lead to slightly less development or breakdown of the, you know, for the, or less fermentation therefore potentially like less digestibility, et cetera? Pot yes. Um, but again, that's kind of about personal preference. Uh, I think each bread has its own merits and it's kind of time of uh, like if you want, you know, and, and a great book for like kind of considering these things is a book like Ken Forkich's Flour, Water, Salt, Yeast, because he kind of points it out. If I want to make bread today from start to finish, maybe I want to make a bread with commercial yeast. If I want a week long project, maybe I want to do a sourdough bread. Each one has their merit. Hmm. Yeah, really interesting. I mean, that was it. when, when, Fleischmann's originally, you know, developed their their yeast products, and they started off with that that wet yeast cake yeah. -like product. Um, I mean, this was seen as a biotechnological marvel, I think, because it did it worked so fast. As soon as it hit the hit the water and the flour, yeah. bam, it would 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 start that fermentation process. So, um, yeah, the bread that I miss the most. I mean, I grew up in the in the United Kingdom, and the one bread that I can't buy buy here is is sold as some. Um, it's called granary bread in in the UK, and you can buy it anywhere. So it's a it's it's a it's a whole wheat flour, maybe mixed with 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 white white flour, but very grainy bread. I, and I don't know how mm -hmm. it's actually made, and I've I've never really found anything that was quite like that here. But that's oh, a a that's challenge. A, okay. <laughs> and you eat it in uh, thick slices with beer and 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 cheese. I think that's probably the one of the world's greatest. Greatest lunches. <laughs> that sounds, sounds delicious. Great. Well, we'll have to we'll have to give it a go. We'll have to get some more pointers from you on what you're looking for. It'll be fun. Yeah, Avery, do you have you know one favorite recipe that you like to make with bread? I you know I can't ask you what you miss or what you crave. Because um, you're very capable, but n n yeah, no, you know I go. Through, I think a really wonderful baguette is is a baguette right out of the oven. Um, or a baguette just in general. I mean, even a baguette like that you purchase and you bring home, but I think a warm baguette. So even if, if you buy your baguette, if you make your baguette, but, or, if, you know, if you're living in France and getting it from a boulangerie, like uh, it's, it's that warm, I think it's probably the crust to crumb ratio of a baguette that I love so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you have something that has a lot of crust to a, a smaller interior. And so you really get that contrast of the crunchy crust and the nice tender inside and yeah so I think baguettes are my my favorite um today <laughs> yeah that sounds great I'm so but pizza does the um, same thing P pizza does the same thing I think that that's kind of probably why I love pizza so much because you have a lot of different textures in pizza as well you know so interesting interesting yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, listen, Nick and Avery, you have been fantastic. Thank both of you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, and thank you to all of you, many people watching from uh, all over the place. It's very exciting. Um, please, you know, if you feel like it, try out a home experiment. This is still expanding. All you need is a bottle, a balloon, some yeast. I think you could also do this with a starter, though it would take much longer. It would take much longer, but it would yeah. I think eventually. Okay. And you, yeah. <laughs> we all have time right now. Um, uh, or, you know, try a pouliche or a, a, a yeast packet and, you know, take a photo and tag us if you like. Um, you can ask any questions or just mention that you're trying it out. We'd love to, you know, keep the conversation going if possible and uh, see what you're all up to and what you take away. Uh, yeah, so till, till next time, take care. And um, thank you, Nick and Avery, again so much for joining thank us. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you guys for tuning in. Yeah.
Yep, thank you.